Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and sign up for my free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter where I share how to reduce risk and create, grow, and protect your wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Richard Smith. Richard, are you ready to join the mission? I've been on this mission with you for 20 years now, Andrew. Happy to be here. <laughs> I am excited to go into that, uh, and I think you're going to bring a lot of value to all of my uh, fellow risk takers. So let me introduce you to the audience. Dr. Richard Smith, Berkeley mathematician and PhD in system science, is a fintech entrepreneur, the CEO of the Foundation for the Study of Cycles and co-founder of the investment tool uh, Finiac. Richard has built a reputation as the doctor of uncertainty amongst his academic peers and has helped government agencies and Fortune 500 companies alike make sense of complex data sets or sets of data. With his background in mathematical theories of uncertainty combined with his investing and trading experience, he is a regular speaker and lecturer and particularly enjoys opportunities to share his knowledge and help others gain an edge in the market. Richard, take a minute and tell us about the unique value you are bringing to this wonderful world. Well, thanks again, Andrew, for having me. And, uh, you know, my PhD was in system science, but it was really in how do we um, be honest about the uncertainties that are in our models? Because we're always modeling things, right? <laughs> if we're dealing with data, it's a model. It's not the thing itself, right? So we're always modeling and we're always dealing with uncertainty. Anything in the real world that is going to have you know, consequences from our decisions and our actions is, is, is fundamentally uncertain. And so how do we use computers? How do we use data? How do we combine those powerful tools with human intuition to improve our decision-making under uncertainty? And so after I finished my PhD on my cake, it said doctor of uncertainty. And um, you know that became a really a mission of mine to, to really help people to embrace uncertainty Yes, everybody wants to reduce risk, but Andrew, mm -hmm. we also have to take risk because investing, speculating is fundamentally the conversion of risk to reward, mm -hmm. okay? We are actually spending risk in the markets and we're looking to convert that risk into reward so we have the highest reward to risk ratio. And so you can't get reward if you don't take risk. So yes, we want to minimize risk, but that doesn't always mean reducing risk, right? So how do I help people to not only use the tools that professionals use for risk mm -hmm. management? You know, um, I know you had Jack Schwager on your show recently, and I yeah. interviewed him myself a few years ago, you know, and I said, what's the one thing that the market wizards have in common? And he's like, well, pretty much nothing, except they're all pretty religious about risk management, right? Mm -hmm. And so risk management really uh, is the name of the game if you're going to stay alive, if you're going to succeed. And, you know, I've always been um, somebody who was pretty good at taking complex ideas and communicating them to the public in a little bit more accessible way than, than uh, maybe other academics. Mm. And so um, part of that actually may date back to some child acting that I did growing up in Los Angeles. I don't know, but uh, one way or another, I've been pretty good at you know being able to explore these complex doctoral level topics um, and then uh, making them accessible to the public and also building software around mm. them, mm. okay? so. Um, you know, I really got involved in markets well back in 99, 2000, investing myself. And then um, the first big project I did was to bring trailing stop loss alerts to the public via a website I built called tradestops.com. And I built that, I launched that in 2005, you know, before brokers had trailing stops. 
And so I really, you know, I got hundreds of thousands of people using trailing stops. And um, I really learned a tremendous amount from that experience. And I learned some some lessons that that really are that I'm still uh, pursuing today. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I mean, I was started out as a fundamental analyst looking at a company and, you know, mm -hmm. also not really taking into consideration the flow of funds. And here I was in Thailand. And if, you know, if, if an American, if American investors turn the, the, the on switch on investing in emerging markets or Thailand, it, you know, it doesn't matter what the valuation of a particular company is. In fact, the companies that are the like most speculative end up going up the most. And so mm -hmm. I started to learn that it was more than just fundamentals. And then I created a framework I call FVMR, Fundamentals, Valuation, Momentum, and Risk. And I figured those that kind of encapsulates, you know, the main factors that I look at. But mm -hmm. um, what I did, yeah. I had a when I was working on my PhD, which I did uh, in China, and I was flying back and forth. Um, I was, I had the problem where I had, I gave a speech about a book I wrote called "How to Start Building Your Wealth Investing in the Stock Market." Very basic, you know, simple stuff. Buy an mm -hmm. index fund if you don't know how to, you know, and and all of that yeah. type of stuff. And I was in the Philippines and I had 2000 college uh, students in a room and I had a three hour time. And I realized like, as I was getting through this, like this don't work, this doesn't work for them because they don't have index funds and they don't have <laughs> access to, uh, you know, it can't invest outside. So I'm like, oh yeah. God, this is so impractical. And then I thought, okay, well, they could invest in funds, but you know, in, in Asia, particularly countries like Philippines, the fees for investing in funds can be massive. So what they could potentially, mm -hmm. and they can only invest at that time in the Philippines. So funds yeah. that are picking stocks in the Philippines. And then I thought, well, okay, the one place it's been, um, de that's been liberalized is broking, stock broking. The fees are down really low. So I could tell them, hey, you should buy a portfolio of 10 stocks. But then I realized that's terrible advice too, because 99% of them are never going to be able to do the research. So I thought, what right. if I have create a way of just saying randomly select 10 stocks? Well, the problem you face there is that, um, you know, what happens when one of them collapses? What do you do? Yeah. So I, I created a, uh, you know, a model and I went through it and I created, I, you know, did like a thousand iterations of portfolios. And I found like mm -hmm. a fan diagram of where the terminal values ended. And mm -hmm. then I asked the question, what if, okay, what if I put a stop loss on an annual basis and have yeah. them re reposition the portfolio randomly every year and put a stop loss at, let's say 10, 20, 30, when I tested all the different ones. And I, I think I came out with about 25% that would, that would be, and basically it caused the fan diagram, it truncated the downside. Yep. And it, in fact, shifted the fan diagram up because the upper bound of the terminal value actually was massive because it forced you to get out of some things. And I thought, okay, that's the advice that I would give in the Philippines. Now, I didn't formalize so, that. When I did trade stops, I had access to all of these portfolios of real people. And I was working with a lot of newsletter publishers who had their track records and so I was able to take a trailing stop strategy and just, you know, say, add it as a mechanical exit strategy to all these literally hundreds and thousands of portfolios. And I would always see improvement of the outcomes when it was a real human decision maker. Okay. If it was a totally mechanical strategy, a trailing stop may or may not add value to it. But when it was a real human decision maker, it almost always added value to it. And one of the most um, like shocking things was the person that I learned about trailing stops from, who was a man named Dr. Steve Sugarud, fantastic uh, investor and newsletter writer. And um, uh, he had taught me about trailing stops. And I, I back tested his portfolio <laughs> using a mechanical trailing stop strategy, and it did better. And it was like, well, why did, wait a minute, you're using trailing stops. You taught me about trailing stops. When I apply a mechanical trailing stop strategy, exit strategy to your portfolio, the performance goes up. What's wrong? And that was one of the first big ahas that I learned was what was going wrong was he was using trailing stops to exit his losers. 
but he wasn't using trailing stops to exit his winners, okay? So he was getting out of his winners early, right? Taking rational profits and, uh, you know, but not letting having some crazy winners, letting some winners mm. just get away from you. And, you know, the markets can remain irrational longer than we can remain solvent. You've probably heard that saying, yep. but it's the same to the downside and the upside, right? So my whole fascination, and it dated back to my PhD work where I was studying Kahneman and Tversky, mm -hmm. right? And prospect theory, the source of Moneyball, right? The Michael Lewis yep movie about Billy Bean and the Oakland A's kind of made that popularized, right? And then he wrote another follow-up book. I think it was called The Undoing Project. It was a, specifically about Kahneman and Tversky. Well, what they, their fundamental insight, you know, that, that Kahneman ultimately was awarded the Nobel Prize for is what's called loss aversion. And the technical way of saying it is that we are risk-seeking when we are losing and we are risk averse when we are winning, <laughs> okay? So both of these have to do with our feelings about loss and our ideas about loss. So when we are losing, okay, the way to avoid loss, right? To, uh, to be loss averse is not to sell because selling means you take the loss. You have mm -hmm. to swallow hard, you gotta sell, you gotta take the loss. So instead of taking loss because we're averse to losing, we double down, we hold on, we turn a short-term trade into a long-term investment. And I've got all kinds of stories, you know, of, of clients of mine, you know, telling me their stories about, I mean, literally like this one guy is a, a safety engineer for, um, uh, for NASA, cool. right? I mean, is, is this guy knows about risk, <laughs> managing mm -hmm. risk. But when it comes to his portfolio, he's an utter basket case. You know, everything's emotional. And uh, so, look, we are risk seeking when we are losing. We want to do anything but take the loss. Okay. So then, when we are winning, what our loss aversion attaches itself to is our gains. So we actually become risk averse when we're winning. So we have this mechanism for downside disaster, mm. but we have no corresponding mechanism for upside explosions, okay? We're always limiting you know, our wins and unlimiting our losses. So that's what interests me. You know, how do we reverse that? And, and that really is very psychological, right? And what's, always, what's fascinated me the most is the way that our our hearts and minds interact with markets, mm. right? And so much, especially for novice amateur investors, you know, almost all of the underperformance, and and this is documented too, is attributed to is attributable to just behavioral biases that are essentially being monetized by, you know, more mature market participants. And all of the businesses that serve retail investors, the broker dealers, you know, um, who don't really give you the, the tools that you need to succeed because really what they, how they make money is on churn or on today with payment for order flow, right? So I was a big critic of Robinhood for years now, you know, all the way back in the pandemic, before the pandemic, about them essentially selling you know, customer data to very sophisticated <laughs> market participants, you know, particularly Citadel Securities and Kim Griffin, you know, mm. who they make billions in up and down markets every year, right? And so, um, you know, it's really how do we position ourselves that we can be in the markets in a way that we can be comfortable and that we can limit our downside and unlimit our upside, right? Mm. So almost all my work is essentially around that simple idea of, you know, how do we stop having irrational losses and rational gains? And how do we begin having rational losses and irrational gains? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key. You know, if you can do that one way or another, you're going to be successful. And most of that, it, you know, and I think more and more today, Andrew, 
it's really more of a mental edge. Like finding a performance edge isn't that hard. You know, mm. there's lots of different ways out there, but it's kind of like what Cliff Asness said, which was one of my favorite quotes, Cliff Asness from Make You Are. You know, I used to think that it, that successful investing was about genius. And I'm paraphrasing now, but more yeah. and more, it's about finding something that works, you know, and doing it religiously. It's really the discipline of acting, you know, and, and you can't be a machine about it either. You can't just turn it over to a machine. Yeah. There's something about the human element of, you know, being in, in that crucible. <laughs> well, it's part of what... And, uh, and having to behave, you know, consistently mm. and on principle that ultimately is the biggest key to success. Yeah. And part of that, that goes back to what Jack said in the interview I did, which is like, find the style that works for you and then, you know, go yeah. in deep and, you know, learn it and study it and think about it. There's, there's, a, there's a probably going to be a time where that, that particular strategy is going to do well and time it's going to do poorly, you but know, understanding and, one. And within a strategy, there are other level, like one of the big things for me has been what's the right time frequency for me to be looking at in my data, you know? So if I'm looking at like, you know, weekly data, forget about it. You know, mm -hmm. it's just, it's too long for my short term, <laughs> my short attention span, right? But then if I go down and look at like 15 minute data or 30 minute data, I'm not in front of my desk enough to be able to really be hovering over the markets all day long. You know, I got mm. businesses, I got kids, I got family. And um, so I've had to really go through a bunch of iterations of finding, you know what, the, the time frequency that works best for me is about two to four hours. So I like to look at my data in two to four hour bars, right? Because then that gives me, you know, trades that might be two weeks to four weeks long it's, and that's, and that's a great lesson right me. there for everybody is like find what works for you because i was and it's even more important than like what system i'm using like that is or it, it's at least equally as important but it's not something that people think about that much you, know, you think oh i gotta go get this tool i gotta go to that tool no you gotta figure out you know how much do you want to sit at your desk <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, how much do you want to stare at a screen or do you want to just like set it and forget it, you know, for decades, right? That's one of the biggest things that you got to figure out. It's funny listening to you talk about that because I was just wondering what, what number you were going to come up with. Um, and I was thinking about mine and mine is three months. Mm -hmm. Every that's three months. Your, your average trade or that's yeah, how often you look at the markets. That's how often I look at the markets. Okay. Great. And, what I've done is, and, and and maybe I'll I'll explain what I do is, let's forget about my methodology for a moment, mm -hmm. as far as yep. like, am I fundamental and am I technical? But let's just imagine, at at some point in time, and I'm looking across many markets, not just let's say U.S., but all across Asia in particular, different markets, uh, different companies produce results at different times, and there's different deadlines, and so it gets a little bit more complicated. But let's just pick an optimum date where new information comes into the market. I would like to act on that right away, but I have a process that takes some time. Mm -hmm. So new information comes into the market at time zero every quarter. Mm -hmm. And so time zero, what I then do is I survey all the stocks in my universe that are investable for me and what my clients want. Mm -hmm. And then I rank them based upon a level of attractiveness, based upon my methodology. Mm -hmm. And then I start at the top of that list and then I, I start to look at it and I, I do some, uh, you know, was there error in the data? Was it just a one-off? You know, there's many different things I may look to try to make sure that that's reasonable. But because of the work that I've done for many years, I know that those stocks at the top generally are going to have a, a slightly higher chance of outperforming in the coming three-month period. Mm -hmm. it, it also depends on how quickly you get into them. It also is a question of, you know, is one of them or the top ones more valuable? I've found that equal weighting is probably the best way because it's really hard to tell. So then mm -hmm. I, I, I do some research on each company. And then after that, I come up with an equal weighted portfolio. And mm -hmm. then, and then I go into that portfolio 
And then I have stop losses at, let's say, 20 to 25 percent. It depends on different markets in mm -hmm. Asia, different mm -hmm. markets. So I've tested stop losses across markets, but let's just say 25 mm -hmm. percent. And therefore, I'm not going to think about it. I'm going to let that strategy work until three months from now. And if anything happens in between, I exit. And that that is my trailing stop loss in a sense, too, because I'm imagining that my portfolio is zero every quarter at time zero. Mm -hmm. And then I can I can completely pick completely new stocks or keep if the other ones score on my attractiveness as still attractive, I keep it in the portfolio. But I reset the stop loss for the new price every quarter. So I don't have an explicit gain, you know, mm -hmm. stop on the gain because I realize that's just that's just going to lower the performance. But I have uh, I do have a, a, a trailing Great. stop loss in a sense. What do you think about that strategy? Um, I think I see a lot of great things in it in particular, you know, and I know you'll recognize this where we really get in trouble is when our minds get fixated on like a single thing in the portfolio. Right. And, um, and so, you know, what you're talking about equal weighting things, uh, having a stop loss. So, you know, again, Jack Schwager mm -hmm. quoting Bruce Kovner, right? 90% of risk management is knowing when you'll sell before you buy. <laughs> so it's just, we have to avoid getting, you know, tar babies in our portfolio. Right. Mm. And, um, and by the way, those can be things that get too big, you know, as well as things that get too, they, that the losses get too brutal, you know, but, uh, mm. yeah, Cliff Fastness again, he was talking to David Rubenstein over at Bloomberg and he's, you know, and David Rubenstein said, what's the biggest mistake most people make. And he said, obsessing over every line versus the total portfolio. Right. Right. So that's something I've really been focused on. That's what talking a little bit about FINIAC, that's what really FINIAC is about. How do you really focus on the portfolio level and build what Ray Dalio called holy grail portfolios of 15 to 20 good uncorrelated return streams? Okay. Um, I like to get a little more nuanced than the equal weight. You know, I like to, I like to have uncorrelated I like to look at correlation so so that I have uncorrelated bets and I like to um, allocate based on volatility. So that's called the risk parity strategy, right? So mm -hmm. you're putting less money into your more volatile positions and more money into your less volatile positions. So I mostly trade futures markets myself. Um, I use mostly uh, cycles analysis the first website I ever built was seasonaltrader.com for Jake Bernstein, if you know Jake. Um, but uh, I got into seasonals and cycles. They're the thing that have really um, uh, stayed with me through thick and thin you know, mm -hmm. over 25 years now in the market. So so anyway, I, like I, I use cycles um, supported by a few technical indicators, and then I construct a you know uncorrelated collection of bets and i allocate position sizes based on volatility right so i'm not going to have the same amount of um, capital in a natural gas bet as i'm going to have in a you know 10 year treasury note mm -hmm. bet mm -hmm. right so i can hold a lot more um 10 year treasuries <laughs> you know than I can natural gas, but they'll end up being about the same level of volatility. So I like to take equal risk on my bets. And then That's... I like to make sure they're uncorrelated. But all of this really has to do with, you know, getting your head out of the weeds and up to the, the portfolio level, right? And I think that's, I just think, you know, I'm so disgusted by the retail investing space Mm. And I'm so disgusted by the the dopamine drip culture, media, social media, et cetera. You know, it's really an addiction model. And they're just trying, they're pushers that are trying to get us hooked. Yeah. You know, and we do it to ourselves, mm. you know, as, m more than anything, right? We're, I mean, ultimately the responsibility lies within each of us to to accept getting hooked or not. 
Yeah. But once you once you understand that that's the model that most of the media we're consuming is really an addiction based model, and that other market participants, mature market participants, institutional market participants are actually monetizing, you know, our addiction in addition to all the media that that's getting you know our our eyeballs and our attention because we live in the attention economy. So mm. that's what people have to get past. You know, when you tell me about the way you're doing it, and obviously you've got a system and it's a system that works for you. It's something that's been honed over decades and, you know, your head's not in the weeds. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I like well, it. I'm going to have a link to the to the Finiac website and there's a couple of points on it um, for the listeners out there. You know, it's great advice about the stop loss it's uh, but let me just read a couple things off the Finiac site. Finiac lets you research investments with clear data meant for real pe people. Build your portfolio, minimize your risk, and then get back to living your life. <laughs> and there's another one at the bottom that I like. I like this one. It says, "You can put the phone down. We'll watch the market for you." So just That's go to idea. Finiac. We're still uh, in our early stages, and we're building it out. But it is my passion project. Frankly, it's hard. Uh, you know, I mean. I'm interested, you know, your, your uh, podcast interests me, Andrew, because you've actually gotten people interested in risk management by framing it as my worst investment ever as storytelling, right? Which is great. When we actually talk to, you know, especially younger investors about risk, they literally say like, I never thought risk was part of investing. Like, I don't think of risk as part of investing. What, what do you, I don't want to talk about risk. You know, or my mom, you know, I named the company Risk Smith and she's like, Risk, R-A-S-K. I said, yeah, Risk. And she's like, why would you name it that? Risk isn't a good thing, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, mom, we're all dealing with risk all the time. Like we got to get our heads out of the sand, but it's a tough sell, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like selling, you know, a salad bar. <laughs> um, it reminds <laughs> me of, of McDonald's. <laughs> I, I gave a, a speech to a lot of, uh, it was about a thousand students um, about uh, ethics. In fact, I, I was mm -hmm. asked for another event. Uh, the Philippine CFA Society invited me to come and speak. So I flew from Thailand to the Philippines and my speech was about my what I learned from my podcast. I call it six, uh, six ways to lose your money and six strategies to win the six lessons I learned from interviewing 600 people about their worst investment ever. Nice. Now it's 700. So I got to think about that. But uh, the thing is, I was going to give a speech about that, which I had prepared. And um, I arrived the night before. And then I thought my speech was in the afternoon, but the event was all day. And it was thousands. Like the the keynote speaker was speaking to about 2000 young people. And then mine would be, I don't know, probably 500 in a breakout session. So um, I arrived, but I thought, yeah, I'll just go there for the whole event. Just get the vibe of everything before I spoke. And basically I arrived and uh, the keynote speaker, uh, uh, the, the the first speaker that like the ministry of finance and stuff spoke. And then eventually uh, the organizers came to see me who they're, they're friends of mine. And they, I said, how's things going? They said, we're in a panic. And I was like, why? And they said, because the speaker that was supposed to give our big keynote at 1030 or 10 or whatever it was, uh, was he's got to take his mom to the hospital. So we're going to have to go up there and talk about case studies. And I was like, what, what is the topic? And she, they said, ethics. I said, well, would you like me to give them a, a lecture on ethics? And they said, yes. And I said, just give me a computer in a room for one hour and I will be ready to go on stage in an hour. And mm -hmm. I have wow. a lecture I call 10 ways ethics adds value to you. Mm -hmm. And I do it by getting people in the audience, like, you know, your pinky finger and then go through all of the different 10 mm -hmm. words that are words in the CFA ethics code. But the idea is, is that I'm trying to tell people uh, that see ethics not in a negative light, but in a positive light. If I could add mm -hmm. these ethical behaviors, I would become more valuable. And yeah. ethical behaviors are not that common. I mean, most people are not criminals, but they're not thinking right. about the interest of the client the way they should. So yes. what I was telling them is, you know, and so I went out and just gave this smashing presentation. And, uh, <clears throat> and then- one of the students came up to me and said something that I, I always remember. And she said, you know, I never thought that. And I'm, the reason I'm telling this whole story, because you said the person said, I never thought about risk. They said, yeah. I never thought that you could be ethical in finance. And I thought, I just planted something in that kid's head that 
Wow. You know, finance is not about ripping people off or, you know, it's all not. that. It's so sad, isn't it? <laughs> Very. So talk about being disgusted and frustrating. So I have a whole course I do called Ethics in Finance. And mm. <clears throat> it's it's based upon CFA ethics because CFA did so much for me and I just love mm -hmm. the topic and I'm an expert in it. But it's all right. about how do I try to make ethics a positive experience, not, you know, here's someone that did this yeah. and don't do that. So fantastic. Um, I, I love it. <clears throat> I have one question I want to ask before we get to the big question, and that is um, <clears throat> the problem I face with stop losses is that <clears throat> when I go, <clears throat> so for some of my portfolios, it's asset allocation, it's funds or mm -hmm. ETFs, let's say. Mm -hmm. And the problem that you face is with a stop loss, it can make perfect sense when you have a portfolio of individual stocks, because a stock could conceivably go to zero or just could go down 50% or 75%. But most of the bigger uh, indices that I'm using, they're not going to disappear, number one. They could mm -hmm. fall, but generally, they're going to rise again. And so a stop loss doesn't work as well with a broad-based index or ETF. And I'm curious if you've got any knowledge or experience about how can I try to minimize the downside with such an instrument? And, and keep in mind, I don't have access to sophisticated tools like all kinds of futures and other things because I'm operating in markets in Asia that just don't necessarily have those things. Yeah, no, I am I hear you. And again, it's one of the reasons that I like allocating by volatility or taking equal risk on my positions, right? Because I do think that stop losses are not as effective today as they were even 10 years ago. You know, going back to the payment for order flow situation, the most valuable order that the market makers will pay for is what's called a non-marketable limit order. Okay. So you know what a market order is, right? You send it to the market. You say, give me a market order. I'll take whatever the price is. And, um, uh, you know, that goes straight to the exchange. Yep. Um, and then there are marketable limit orders, which can go to the exchange. Um but something like a trailing stop is actually kind of a complicated order, right? And that's actually why I was able to build a service that offered trailing stops uniquely because you have to recalculate what the price is at which you're going to exit, right? Because if you buy it at $100 and your stop's 25% and you're initially at $75, but if the stock goes up to $200 now, you know, your stop, your 25% stop is at $150. So that price is always changing and somebody has got to calculate that. So it's a non-marketable limit order. And that's what the institutions pay the most money for to the Robin Hoods of the world, right? Because that gives them the most market intelligence about the structure of the market. So that, um, you know, these new uh, AI tools of large language models, so-called, mm. right? Well, people, you know, these institutions have had these large variable machine learning models that they put all kinds of data into that they buy from Robin Hood and, and, you know, all other places to make massive, essentially AI models of the markets. And so, you know, trailing stops, um, I think have become more compromised, more, mm. there's more visibility into where those stops are. So I, you know, I mostly do market orders at this point. That doesn't really address exactly what your question is. It's basically, should I be using a trailing stop on these, you know, highly liquid? Well, let, let's, let's try to um, break that down for a second. Let's sure. just say that um, I have a core allocation to um, world equity. And let's say 50% mm -hmm. yeah. of my portfolio is that. And then I'm tilting the, the portfolio, let's just say that uh, a country like, uh, let's say Poland is interesting right now. Mm -hmm. So Poland is in yeah. the all country world index at 1%, yeah. but yeah. I'm going to double that to 2%, let's say, or 3%. Yeah. And yeah. let's say that uh, tech is doing really well. So I've allocated to a country, a little bit increased the weighting of that country. And let's say tech's doing well. So let's just say that I allocated on momentum based and I increase the weighting in tech. Now let's just look mm -hmm. at those two two allocations. There's a different level of volatility. Let's just say for right for this argument's sake that the Poland index 
uh, uh, ETF is much more volatile than the tech ETF. Originally, mm-hmm. I was planning on putting, let's say, you know, 5% in each as an example uh, to, to simplify things. Let's make a model. Yep. Uh, so mm-hmm. to simplify things, let's say I was going to put 5% in each. Yep. What what would the volatility in the the Poland index tell me relative to the tech index about how should I consider my weighting or something like that? Is that yep. what you're talking about? Yeah. So you might put 7% in tech and 3% in Poland. You know, to still allocate the ten percent to those two combined things, but you're putting less into the more volatile position because really, what bothers people, you know, is when when a loss in an individual position it's a certain dollar level, right? It's like, oh, I'm really uncomfortable with that, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So if you have less, you know, of your position, if you have a smaller position size in a more volatile position, and a larger position size in a less volatile position. You know, you, the daily dollar changes in those positions are going to be, you know, more similar, right? Mm. So that's a very helpful strategy for, um, you know, essentially accomplishing some of the similar things that a trailing stop accomplishes, which is risk management, basically. So I like to say this is the number one risk management um, podcast, but I don't really teach risk management and I don't have a case. I don't have all of these lessons on risk management, but these types of discussions give us a lot of value. So for listeners out there, this has been a long, you know, preamble uh, discussion mm-hmm. because I think there's a lot that we can gain from what you, what you understand, Richard. And so let's just summarize. I'm going to summarize just for, for the ending up this session. And that is, The first thing is that if you've got a portfolio of stocks, consider some type type of trailing or otherwise stop loss that can protect you from the risk of the downside. If you are- Especially if you're a really novice investor. Yeah. Okay. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Yep. And then the second one is look at the- the volatility aspect, look, I, you've also talked about the correlation. If you've got a portfolio of 10 or 20 stocks, look at the correlations at them. You may actually realize that, oh, wait a minute, I'm kind of triple. These three stocks are highly correlated, meaning I'm really increasing my exposure to yeah. something that they're all reacting to. And therefore, yes. I should think about um, reducing either a little bit of the exposure to all of them or eliminating yeah, one mean, or two you- from the portfolio. Think about it in terms of golf, right? Most golfers, you're, you know, you're hooking way out to the right or you're, you know, uh, sorry, hooking way out to the left or slicing way out to the right, (laughs) you know? Um, And that's kind of like what happens with the stocks in our portfolio. But if you take the average of those, you know, you'll end up down the middle of the fairway. So how do you kind of, or think about, you know, like the, another, um, image I like to use are the hurricane forecast models, if you've seen those, right? Um, So you have this kind of spaghetti, you know, type models are actually called spaghetti models, where you have all these different lines that the hurricane might follow, you know, and mostly it ends up going down the middle there. But how do you tighten up those lines um, and still like keep that overall portfolio within a tighter set of lines than the individual positions. So that's that's really, you know, at the end of the day, most people are like, I just want to look at one number. How how much did I lose, you know, or how much did I gain? Hmm. And it's it's really that when the losses get to um uh out of our comfort zone that that our head starts to play games with us, right? Hmm. So that's really like where having uncorrelated bets comes in, uncorrelated investments. And again, Mm -hmm. this is Ray Dalio, you know, biggest hedge fund, most successful hedge fund manager in the world uh, said the holy grail of investing is 15 to 20 good uncorrelated return streams. And uh, that's some sage advice right there. (laughs) Um, And that's really what I've tried to make accessible through FINIAC is give people a chance to see how to build Holy Grail portfolios, you yeah. know, and to say like, look, if you've got this collection, you know, you've got some money to put to work, you want a, a new position, you've got this collection of candidate positions and, you know, more or less they're, they're, 
they're equal in terms of your their goodness, you know, the likelihood that they're going to go up, um, then you want to take the one that is least correlated to your existing portfolio because it gives you an overall smoother ride for your portfolio. And like Cliff Asness said, uh, you know, um, like the biggest mistake people make is focusing on the individual positions instead of on the portfolio as a whole. Yeah. And I think for the, for the beginners out there, it's all about staying in the game. It reminds me of a story of my yeah. best friend who runs our coffee factory. And we've been having, having a coffee factory in Thailand for about 28 years. And um, Dale, basically, one night I called him and I was like, how's it going? He said, it was awful. You know, it's just awful today. You know, it's just, and it's like, it's like business is like a a prize fight, you know. But in the old days, the prize fights, the boxing matches were like 70 rounds, right? <laughs> now we have three well, rounds in the Olympics and, you know, 12 rounds, but they were like 70 rounds. And so he, he, we, we had watched a fight of Jack Johnson on video and he, he came back and he said, yeah, I'm in round, you know, 47, you know, <laughs> like I'm tired. And, mm -hmm. but he said, but the objective in round 47 is just not getting knocked out that you can't mm. attack in every round. Mm. So I think what you're saying for a young person and a new investor is protect your capital first. And that mm -hmm. allows you to stay in the game and keep learning and then, you know, over time winning. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and make sure that you don't get stuck on, you know, one thing that, mm. that, has, that becomes kind of disproportionately you know, um, important in your mind. So I just wrote an article called to NVIDIA or not to NVIDIA. Right? It's kind of a play on Shakespeare to mm -hmm. be or not to be right. But, you know, we're constantly hammered in the media with these hot button issues, right? You know, <clears throat> Musk or Zuck, who's going to win in the cage fight? You know, like when NVIDIA came out and they had an incredible quarter, right? And they raised the their guidance for the next quarter, I mean, basically doubled their revenues in like a six month period. You know, it was, it was crazy. It was yeah. wildly successful. Great. But for the next two weeks, it was like the only question was, are you NVIDIA? Are you in NVIDIA or aren't you? Like, mm -hmm. were you smart or are you dumb? Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, that there's, there's 10 or 20,000 different things you could put your money in, right? Yep. <laughs> NVIDIA wasn't the only stock in the world. But that's the media level example of what happens to us individually too. Not only like what the media is feeding us, but the stories that we're telling ourselves, right? So for me recently, I got stuck in a position um, in the uh, NASDAQ futures. I was short the NASDAQ futures and the NASDAQ kept going up and up and up. And I'm like going, ah, oh, you damn NASDAQ, you know, you, you're going to go down. I just know it. You're, this is ridiculous, whatever, mm -hmm. right? And so- that position became this kind of something that I was constantly talking to myself about, yep. constantly rationalizing, right? And when you see that happening, you know it's out of balance and you have to figure out how to get out of that, yep. right? Yep. So focusing on the portfolio level as a whole immediately, like I went back to my portfolio and I'm like, wait a minute, the NASDAQ isn't the only fish in the sea. You know, there's there's at least a dozen other highly liquid futures markets that I can yeah. participate in. Let me get a balanced portfolio going again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> get back to my Balance. own rules and uh, and stop this, you know, insanity. Well, on that note, now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstance leading up to it, and then tell us your story. Well, I'm going to go back to the beginning and I, I've had worse investments than this in terms of dollar amounts, but this is still the one that left the most searing uh, <laughs> mark on my investor psyche, right? And it was uh, 98, 99, right? During the dot-com boom and I had just started investing and I was in graduate school at the time working on my PhD and, uh, you know, over about 18 months I get my account up from, you know, like 300%, okay? From $10,000, which was my life savings at the time, up to $40,000, right? And I'm going, Phew, what a smart guy. This PhD is really paying off. And, uh, 
I'm actually getting married in June of 2000 and I'm about to let the in-laws know, you know, I'm a real man. I, I don't need as much help with the wedding. I got a lot of this covered. And then March of 2000 hits, you know, and uh, it's like all of a sudden my $40,000 is like $30,000 practically overnight. Mm. And, you know, that's, that's a big loss for me <laughs> at that moment. Right. Mm. But but what was really shocking about the whole thing is the lies that I told myself through the whole process, right? So he gets down to $30,000 and then I'm like, well, look, let's not get greedy here. We'll get out when it gets back to $35,000, <laughs> okay? So then it gets back to $35,000 and you say, well, you know, it's back to $35,000. Why couldn't it get back to $40,000? Heck, maybe it could go to $50,000, you know? And it was just this, I'm, I'm I'm working on my PhD as the doctor of uncertainty and I'm I'm having these insane rationalizations you know that uh are very embarrassing <laughs> so you know it doesn't get back to $35,000 it gets down to $20,000 oh I'll get out when it gets back to $25,000 now you know finally it gets back to $10,000 and at that point I panic and I just like get all my money out of the market like let me get married <laughs> let's let's just put this investing thing to the side for a little bit you know and then it was like 5 years later that I started tradestops.com and I started mm -hmm. integrating trailing stops and uh and then it started to really turn into a lifelong passion for me so and how would you that summarize was still the uh you know the uh the most um yeah the most searing lesson. <laughs> there have been bigger dollar losses and I, I may, I still make bad trades today, mm. you know, knowing all that I know and, and all that I preach, even this is hard stuff. It's hard to do the right thing in the markets. Yeah. I mean, they wouldn't, you know, they, the markets wouldn't be um, as interesting or as potentially valuable if it wasn't hard. You know, anything valuable is hard. <laughs> and so let's let's think about a young person right now who's yeah. overwhelmed with all of the media out there about all the different, you know, information that that you weren't exposed to to the same degree and the ease of yeah. the platforms and all of that. And they're starting out, they get into a portfolio and it starts to rise. Based upon what you learned from this story and and what you've continued to learn all of your life, what's one action you'd recommend that they take to avoid suffering the same fate? I like to say, get your head out of your mass media. <laughs> so okay, that's a good one. Know. Get your head out of your mat out, out of your mass. Get your head out of your mass media. You know, it's just if everybody's looking in the same place, the opportunity isn't there. AI right now, right? Yeah. Nvidia, you know, Apple, not I mean Microsoft. Uh, all of the, you know, there's seven or eight tech companies that have basically dominated the, the NASDAQ this year, or dominated the stock market, the S and P 500. I think something like 26% of the S and P 500, these seven companies make up 26% out of mm. 500 companies. There's seven, they're over 26% of the market cap of the S and P 500 is in these seven companies. So that's not the place you want to be looking right now. You know, so you have to be willing to look off the beaten path. Mm. And that's why I love this, you know, what I've done at Finiac, because there you can go. You know, one of the things I like to do, Andrew, is I use the 13F filings of what great investors are buying and holding in their portfolios, right? Um, and uh, and that gives me like maybe 100 ideas I can work with if I yeah. have, um, you know, uh, Rajiv Jain at GQG Partners is one that I've been mm following he's got 100 you know good investments in his portfolio if i just take those 100 investments say which of these is uncorrelated to my existing portfolio lo and behold you know i get 10 ideas that i've never heard about in the media <laughs> before so do i want to listen to cnbc or yahoo finance or fox business you know where they're always just saying the same thing over and over again or do i want to go look at what's in the portfolios of wildly successful investors you know, just add one or two things at a time to my portfolio when I have a little bit more capital to allocate and uh, and find the ones that are uncorrelated to my existing portfolio and build my portfolio the way geniuses like Ray Dalio do. So um, that's where I've gotten to and anybody can do it. You know, you just have to be willing to um, 
you know, take the road less traveled. So I'm going to, I'm going to do a terrible uh, podcast host do, and that is answer the question for the guest. The next question is what's a resource. And I would just say, you know, Finiac is a place that you can start. And as it says, start now for free, you know, and yeah, start free playing right around now. and learning. Um, so let Thank me, you. Yep. <clears throat> la last question. What is your number one goal for the next 12 months? My number one goal for the next 12 months, I mean, fi personally, financially, is to get my business cash flow positive. <laughs> That's the key. Yeah. That's the key. Well, we'll be so we're definitely that. not in the growth at all costs world anymore. Mm, yeah. And, and that's uh, a know, good I'm lesson a, for everybody. I'm a, I'm a fintech startups. entrepreneur. And, um, you know, I mean, you were really valued for growth at any cost, even just two years ago. And uh, it's not about that anymore. And I think that's a good change, actually, even though it's cost me a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think ultimately it's the right thing. It's a better um, way to you know build an economy and uh, and build a society. So I think it's uh anyway that that's my goal for the next twelve months is get my businesses cash flow positive. There's something to be said for bootstrapping and not you know getting out there and necessarily yeah. raising capital and forcing yourself to develop. The cash flow from it. And for the listeners out there, you can listen to episode 235, which was Rand Fishkin uh, and his uh, you know, experience in the startup world. Particularly, he said the title of his don't be afraid to stand up against the growth at all costs venture capital mm. model. And I think yeah. he gave a really good discussion about that. So for the listeners out there, you know, make sure to to check that out because that gives, you know exactly what can go wrong if all you're doing is focusing on that so i think i'll go listen to that one it's it's great <laughs> Rand, rand's amazing uh, well listeners there you have it another story of loss to keep you winning remember i'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives as we conclude richard i want to thank you again for joining our mission and on behalf of a stots academy i hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Stay the course. Remember that uh, it's time in the markets, not just timing the markets. Although you can still time the markets, mm -hmm. but you got to make sure you're still in. <laughs> exposure matters. Yep. And targeting wow. the right level of exposure for you is uh, is very important. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today we added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.